Perhaps we could reach as high as 57.5? With all due respect, Mr. Brackman, this is not a negotiation. It's definitely a negotiation. Hey, Legal Eagles, D. James Stone here teaching you how to think like a lawyer so you can crush law school. I knew from a very early age that I wanted to be a lawyer, and not just any lawyer, a trial lawyer. And I learned that by watching lawyers on TV. Now, having been a trial attorney for over 10 years now, I see that some shows are more realistic than others. So I thought I'd take some time to review some of the most famous legal scenes from TV history. The first scene comes from the show Allie McBeal. Well, as I said, her arm brushed mine. And when she brushes an arm, it's with sexual intent. Objection. Just tell us what happened after she brushed your arm, sir. So that's actually a really good objection, uh, the kind of objection that you would see in most trials. The witness here is testifying to things that he has no personal knowledge of, which is specifically what the mental impressions are of another person. You can't testify as to what another person is thinking. So the objection that's being made was correct. Uh, and the judge was right to sustain it. They didn't actually say objection, lack of personal knowledge, or speculation, but the judge understood that and made the right call. Well, I looked at her. There was... I was feeling a little... chemistry. She, uh... then brought her hand to my, uh... my, uh... So that's a good recovery by this witness. Uh, the judge sustained the objection to essentially speculation, and the witness then proceeds to talk about only those things that he personally observed. And he testifies to two things. One, as to his own internal state of mind, which he's allowed to testify to. Um, and he also testifies as to physical acts that he actually watched, he was a percipient witness to. An expert can opine about things that are outside of their personal knowledge, but a lay witness, like most witnesses, can only testify to the things that they have seen or heard or personally witnessed. So that's what this witness is doing here. Groin area. She began to fondle me a little, and I, well, I... <laughs> So sometimes there are outbursts in court. Uh, that's not particularly unusual. Uh, I think the, the screeching that the uh, attorney has done here is a little bit unusual and is really bad for his client. So he would be better served by uh, keeping his mouth shut and uh, not screeching um, in a way that prejudices his client. Potentially, uh, that's a, a prejudicial act to his client, which, uh, you know, sometimes you can't control things and, uh, you know, things happen. But being professional in court is uh, a very important thing. You don't want to lose credibility in front of the judge or the jury. Uh, and while that particular Yelp was probably unrealistic, what is actually more realistic about this show compared to most is that the lawyers are not running around the well of the court, uh, the, the area between the judge and counsel table, like they own the place. It appears that the uh, attorney who is asking questions is right in front of counsel table. Uh, and usually if, if you're conducting an examination, you're not going to be right up against the witness. You're not going to be pacing up and down the well. You're going to be either at counsel table uh, or you're going to be behind it. And here uh, it appears that the attorney is just in front of counsel table, which is usually allowed. You have to ask permission of the judge if you are going to enter the well. But it, they're not doing something that's crazy like running around yelling like you'll see in a lot of procedural dramas. So that part is actually realistic. The Yelp is probably not, not so realistic. The next scene is from Boston Legal. Routinely go to church on Sundays and ceremoniously eat the body of Christ, drink his blood. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Jesus said that. How dare you? What? Who have I offended now? How dare you take a holy sacrament literally? Is that not done? You have equated it with a vile and despicable act. Okay, so here a couple things are going on. It appears that the attorney is giving a closing argument uh, about uh, a client who has uh, conducted an act of cannibalism, uh, and he is uh, defending that by saying that... Uh, the, there are other religious orders that uh, conduct an act that is similar to cannibalism. The judge here has uh, done essentially the, the worst thing you can do as a judge, which is to opine personally um, against another attorney. So he's taken offense at something that the attorney has said. 
Uh, he is not making a legal argument. He is simply just issuing his own personal thoughts about what is or is not allowable uh, according to the, the scripture. Um, that is, uh, th that's the worst thing a, a judge can do. A judge is supposed to be impartial. And if you have uh, lost your impartiality and it's clear to the jury that you are, are no longer impartial, uh, then it's your duty as a judge probably to declare a mistrial. Um, and uh, potentially there could be some uh, professional responsibility actions taken against the judge because uh, he's shown that he cannot be impartial. The next step that, uh, that I would do if I was an attorney is uh, move to uh, dismiss the judge uh, for being prejudiced. And I would use the record of the court to show this lack of impartiality. Potentially, uh, that's the, the plan that this attorney has done is to show that the judge is not uh, being uh, impartial and uh, trying to, to get some favor from the jury. Um, but uh, a, a long-standing judge, as it appears this judge would be, uh, would never make these sort of, of statements. And if they did, they could be removed from the office. I apologize, Your Honor. I certainly don't mean to indict Holy Communion, but let's not carry on with the idea that the notion of cannibalism offends the sanctity of life. It has roots not only in sacraments, not to be taken literally, but also Greek mythology. It's still glorified in certain sections of both the South and I believe Malibu. And I might add, it's not illegal. So uh, the, the lawyer here is uh, making an impassioned plea, which you're allowed to do to the jury. But in so doing, it sounds like he's bringing in a lot of facts and figures that uh, almost certainly did not come out in trial. And uh, it's really important for the jury only to, um, to use facts that came out in trial uh, to base their decision. And, and all of these, uh, these statistics, uh, it's possible that the... Um, that the lawyer brought them in through a process called uh, judicial notice, which is that sometimes there are statistics that are so incontrovertible that the court will just allow them to be brought into court without uh, showing an underlying basis. For example, if you were going to say that a certain date uh, occurred on a certain day, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you could uh, show that on a calendar and, and that fact would be so incontrovertible that you're allowed to bring that in. These statistics uh, about cannibalism and about uh, the, the notion of uh, who and who is not um, uh, cared for by the government, that, that seems like a, a pretty far stretch and uh, it would be improper for him to cloud the record with these uh, extrinsic facts that did not come out. The next scene comes from L.A. Law. UCLA, Harvard Law. Woo, UCLA. Editor of the Law Review. Ames competition, best oralist. Uh, so the Ames competition is a real life competition at Harvard Law that is uh, for a moot court. And they're saying that this person won uh, best oralist at the moot court competition. Moot court is where attorneys pretend to be appellate attorneys, not uh, trial attorneys. Uh, and they uh, handle a fake appellate court case in front of a panel of judges. And the Ames uh, moot court competition is very famous. They are so famous, in fact, that they often get Supreme Court judges to judge the, uh, the competitors. So that's a, that's a fun, uh, real-life um, fact that they threw in there. Well, I am impressed, Mr. Rollins. Thank you, sir. Uh, an attorney could often be impressed by that resume. He went to UCLA for undergrad, Harvard Law School, uh, won the moot court competition, and uh, he's now interviewing for a job in Los Angeles. That's not a bad resume to, to bring in there. Tell us a bit about yourself. Well, let's see. My, uh, my mother's an attorney. My father's a professor of economics at UC Riverside. I've uh, clerked for the past few summers at Felder Ivy McCoy. As a matter of fact, they offered me a permanent position. But under the heading less is more... I think that a small, prestigious firm such as Mackenzie Brackman could be more responsive to my personal needs, or at least Bill Howard thinks. That's so. really interesting. Uh, so that is uh, a very realistic way of going about getting a job in law school. This seems to be a, a recent um, graduate from Harvard Law School. He said he clerked 
uh, for a few years at a law firm. The, I don't think the law firm is real, but often the way you get a job in law school is you uh, clerk, uh, it's called a summer associateship uh, with a law firm. And uh, if you do a good job uh, in your 2L summer, then they will often offer you a job upon graduation. And what this uh, young man is saying he's doing is he doesn't want to work for this big prestigious law firm. Instead, he wants to come out uh, and interview with his boutique law firm because it suits his whatever it is that he's looking for in Los Angeles. So, uh, so far, uh, a pretty realistic uh, reason for this young man to apply for a job uh, at this, this law firm. So far, so good. Or at least Bill Howard thinks so. Bill Howard, as in Howard Enterprises? Yes, sir. He's been a close personal friend of my family for years. Oh boy, um, I don't think it's particularly realistic to drop names in the interview that might go unsaid, uh, but to bring it up and, and uh, to boast about your family connections in the middle of the interview, that's not, uh, that's not good form. Um, it happens, uh, it probably happens more often than it should. I mean, people probably are, are better served by um, getting in through merit than connections. But uh, you know, sometimes uh, family connections matter. It's uh, it's a it's a part of the world. Thank you. What would you be looking for in the way of compensation? Seventy-two five. And I wouldn't be opposed to your designating a percentage of that as a signing bonus. Excuse me, but <clears throat> we've been starting our associates pretty much commensurate with the going rate, which, as I'm sure you're aware, is considerably lower. I understand, sir, but I've already been offered seventy-one with Horton Gold. So much for your doctrine of less is more. <laughs> Sometimes more is more. <laughs> this is really interesting. Uh, it's not often that uh, junior associates bargain so hard for their salary. But what he's saying is that the firm that he was a summer associate at and he, he clerked there has already given him a job offer, which is normal. He spent his summer there and they gave him an offer upon graduation. And he's trying to leverage that to get a better salary at this law firm. And uh, most law firms do actually uh, adhere to sort of a standard rate. Um, this is in the early, uh, early 90s or the late 80s. Um, and they're talking about salaries of, of $70,000 or more. That, that seems about right for the time. Uh, these days, uh, uh, graduates from prestigious law firms going into uh, the top-notch law firms uh, are likely to get a salary of between one hundred and sixty and one hundred and ninety thousand dollars per year, and there's sort of a standard scale that is applied. And most law firms say that they are lockstep, so you don't have any bargaining power. They pay all first-year associates X amount. Uh, between 160 and 190, and he's trying to do his best to uh, to get even more out of of this firm. So, uh, good for him. I I, I wish it was uh, possible for more law students to bargain more, but uh, but sadly, most law firms are are lockstep and uh, not a lot of bargaining power there. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps we could reach as high as 57.5. With all due respect, Mr. Brackman, this is not a negotiation. It's definitely a negotiation. Gentlemen, it's been a genuine honor and a pleasure. Thank you very much. He's a winner. I want him to be our winner. I strongly disagree. Well, I'm pulling rank, Douglas. What are you going to do when his salary becomes common knowledge among the other associates? We'll see that it doesn't. Ooh, that's true. Uh, because law firms uh, ostensibly pay first year associates all the same if it became public knowledge that one associate was paid significantly more than the rest that would cause some dissent the next clip comes from boston legal value of human life it's a bugger my friend jerry spence tells a story of this paper boy delivering his papers on his morning route one day. He throws the paper through the window, shatters the glass, blinds a woman. What's the value of that? Hmm. Paper boy decides to give the woman his profits for the week. Not very much, considering she was blinded. Now here, we have a loss of life. 
unavoidable loss, not merely an accident, one they could have prevented. So I think the paper boy had the right idea. At the end of this trial, I'm going to get up. I'm going to ask the defendant to pay my client one week's profit. Now, let's make that a day's profit. Let's not get greedy here. We may not be able to put a price on Mary Finnerty's life, but we can at least pay her family the profits for the day they killed her. So there's a couple things going on here which are pretty interesting. Number one is that um, there are almost always two phases to major personal injury cases. Um, sometimes they are tried together, sometimes they are tried separately, and there, there are reasons for that. And, and the two things that you have to show is liability, which means that uh, the defendant is responsible for the injuries of the plaintiff. But then separate from that is how much compensation should the defendant pay the plaintiff if they are liable. And those are often called liability versus compensation. So here, uh, the attorney is pretty confident or, or that perhaps they've already established uh, liability. And so they're simply going to the damages portion of the trial. And, and what he's hinting at is how do you compensate a, uh, a plaintiff for the injury that they have uh, received. And in the law, there are two ways of going about it. One is pure compensation for the injury. So however much you are injured, you're going to get a monetary sum that is equal to that amount. But if the defendant's actions are so egregious that they warrant um, punishment, it's rare in civil cases, but sometimes you're allowed what are called punitive damages. And that's what uh, William Shatner here is hinting at. He's saying that as a punitive measure, the defendant should be uh, required to disgorge a single day's profit uh, for the injuries that they caused. And I don't know what, what law is being uh, broken here that would um, allow him to get punitive damages. Punitive damages are, are somewhat rare. Uh, they require they usually require some sort of egregious conduct um, but if you are allowed punitive damages sometimes they're set by law and sometimes they are just simply a, a, a fraction that's set by the judge or the jury of the worth of the defendant or sometimes even the uh, profit that they would have uh, received in a day or a month or a year um, it's uh, it the punitive damages should be large enough to punish the defendant. So if you're dealing with a really wealthy defendant, then it needs to be uh, large enough to uh, punish them for them. Because sometimes if you have uh, what would seem like a large amount, if you're dealing with a multi-billion dollar corporation, it doesn't really uh, punish them in a way that they're going to take notice. So that's what William Shatner is going after here, a day's profit uh, to really make them uh, feel the pain that they inflicted on the plaintiff here. What could be more fair than that? What could be more fair? So fair. Hmm? My client's profits are not relevant. The number of stores they have is not relevant. How dare you go into that? And how dare you not shut him down? Uh, so whether or not the, uh, the defendant's profits are relevant would be decided long before they get to trial. Uh, there would be motions that would uh, lay the foundation for uh, why a, a corporation's profits are relevant to punitive damage. There would be uh, a slew of pretrial motions uh, to decide whether or not the profits and the punitive damages of a company are relevant to the case or not. Um, if indeed there has been no uh, motion for that and there has been uh, no uh, back and forth between the attorneys and the judge then it would have been incredibly improper for William Shatner to bring that up in front of the jury p potentially even leading to a mistrial but uh, what TV shows often get wrong is the mountain of paperwork that happens before trial. All of these decisions, all these legal questions are settled long before you get to court. They would not have a sidebar like what's going on here uh, to decide in the middle of trial, whether he's allowed to make these arguments or not. Uh, that's totally unrealistic. May I go off the record, briefly? Go right ahead. Thank you. This is not for your ears, by the way. You stupid bastard. Cases rarely turn on what's legally relevant. What you have to be concerned with here is that all shop makes $160 million of pure profit a day. A day. 
The jury will get wind of those numbers. In which case, we'll appeal. Great. And do you think you'll be the lawyers to handle that appeal when your client gets whacked with a $50 million judgment? You're an ass. You're an ass. You're an ass. <laughs> so, a couple things going on here. Uh, he's basically admitted that... Uh, the profits of the defendant are not relevant, uh, not something you want to do if you are trying to get those profits uh, in, in front of the jury. Uh, probably not a good idea to admit to the judge that uh, they're, they're not relevant because the judge has a duty to make sure that no irrelevant evidence comes before the, the, the jury. Um, William Shatner does hint at something that is often the case, which is that the same lawyers that tried the case uh, are rarely the ones to take the appeal. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. There are specialists who handle the appeal. But the opposing attorney is absolutely right that if he brings in these prejudicial facts uh, against the will of the court, then he has a, a dead winner on appeal, or at least he should. Now, whether they're going to want to go through the uh, cost of have going through another trial again after the appeal. That's a, a bigger question, but it sounds like a big company. And uh, they may want to go through all that again uh, on the idea that the plaintiff's attorneys won't want to go through the trial one more time and, and potentially lose. Uh, so some of that is realistic, but this whole monologue in front of the judge, uh, that is not gonna happen. The next clip comes from Rick and Morty. You are about to enter the courtroom of Judge Morty Durham Jr. The people are real. The cases are real. The rulings are final. This is his courtroom. This is Judge Morty. 60-year-old inmate Rick Allen is being accused of committing murder of a fellow inmate at Georgia Penitentiary. Mr. Allen claims that he is being set up and that his lawyer is requesting sexual favors in exchange for proper legal advice. Okay, <clears throat> okay, Mr. Mr. Allen. Right. I believe that I believe that your case is was going to be going to trial not this Monday but the following Monday. Do you understand that? Yes. Uh... Okay. I tell you, if you need to tell me something, I want I'll let you come up here to the podium so you can speak into the microphone. Uh, so my understanding is that this clip is actually uh, a real life transcript uh, that happened in a criminal proceeding. Uh, that the uh, the makers of Rick and Morty then uh, set to the voices of Rick and Morty and animated it, uh, and it really sounds like the some of the crazy stuff that can happen uh, in criminal proceedings. Um, wh what's happening here is not uncommon. Um, often the defendant will uh, not be happy with his publicly appointed attorney, uh, and he or she will request that uh, that attorney be either substituted or that the defendant is allowed to just handle things on their own. And that's a thing that happens. It's called uh, representing yourself pro se uh, when you uh, represent yourself. Uh, and there's an old adage that uh, anyone who represents himself has a fool for a client. And uh, the judges don't like it. Uh, you're not generally going to do a very good job, uh, even if you've been trained as an attorney, which most people have not. Uh, but judges hate it because it slows things down. They really have to hold the hands of uh, the defendants who represent themselves, um, and it can really just muck things up, which I'm guessing is what happens here. You have a right to an attorney. This lawyer has- You don't have a right to a specific attorney. This lawyer has made sexual advances on me. He, well, he's mis misrepresenting my case. He told me if, if I wanted him to do a good job, I had to let him give me oral sex. He's had doctors- Oh boy, uh, so defendants will say a lot of crazy things. Uh, to try and uh, get their way, and uh, I'm, I'm guessing the attorney did not uh, make uh, sexual advances. I'm, I'm thinking that this guy is just uh, saying whatever he can to, to get a different attorney. He's had doctors at Central State Hospital put a He's false... He's had doctors at Central State Hospital? Put a false diagnosis on me. Okay. Um, I, I don't... You know, I know Mr. Wyatt pretty well, and I don't think he has the ability to make doctors at Central State do anything. Well, they did it, and he's the one that had me sit down there. Well, you know, they may have done it, but I don't think that... And he had anything to do with it. All right, well, he won't give me the discovery. He, well, There's I'm, things in discovery he's supposed to give me the incident and told me that it was the discovery. Okay. They're alternating okay. documents that I've if read. You, if you want... 
All right, so here there's a, a ring of truth in what the defendant is saying. Uh, the prosecution has an obligation to disclose all of their evidence to the defendant, and that includes um, documentary evidence, that includes what witnesses they're going to call against that person at trial. Um, uh, gone are the days where either the prosecution or the defense could ambush the other side. You have to disclose all of that uh, ahead of time. And uh, so what this defendant is claiming is that he didn't receive some of that evidence and uh, that he wants it. Uh, and if that is indeed the case, uh, it's probably not the case because this guy sounds crazy. Uh, if there is something that has been withheld, um, the prosecution needs to turn that over to him. All right, so those are some of my favorite legal TV shows. Uh, I can see some of those situations happening in real life, but others would get the attorneys disbarred and probably get the judges thrown off the bench. Uh, if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more Lawyer Reacts videos or hear about my law school experience, click on this short playlist that I put together. Uh, it includes my reaction to some of the most famous legal scenes in the movies. Uh, and please subscribe so you don't miss out on the next video. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one.